Hello, everybody. My name is David Finkel. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Volunteers here at the Strand, welcome to the first lecture in over two years that we've hosted here. We've had many interesting lecture series in the past, and we are thrilled to have um, the lecture series this year it's called Understanding Government, where we have topics of our local government and what kind of how things work. Unlike years past, uh, we would like to welcome our online audience via Facebook Live. Uh, not only can you watch this live, but you will be able to watch it at any time afterwards on the Strand site uh, through our videos. And we're very pleased. Uh, as I'm doing this, I want to give a shout out to Cody Veerkamp, who's currently on the call in Columbus, Ohio, and he's the one who set this up. And if you can see this, Cody, we must have done the right thing. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll see how the live audience does. If you are watching online, you're welcome to submit questions, just as you would if you're sitting in the audience. For those of you sitting in the audience, after we're done, we will have a question and answer se session. So tonight's topic is school board governance. As many of you know, I serve on the Shelbyville Central School Board and have done for many years. Uh, and uh, so it's a topic that I know relatively well, and I am pleased that this is a great kickoff for our first lecture series, uh, and we are just uh, tickled pink to be back in operation. COVID's been very hard on us, very hard two years, so we would hope that you would come back to something else here. And what is that something else? Well, how about we are doing poetry on April 27th, and then we are doing a Doors weekend on the last weekend of April, April 29th and 30th. The 29th, we are going to be showing the 1991 Oliver Stone film, The Doors. And then on the 30th, right here on this stage, live, is Retro uh, Nation. They're the uh, Doors tribute band, and they play all the music of The Doors uh, right here live on our stage. It'll be a lot of fun. So tickets are available for that. That is how we stay afloat. We are unlike most not-for-profits. We don't ask for money or do things like that. We rely upon you coming to our performances. So anyway, let's get started today. I'd like to welcome to the stage uh, Steve Horton. He's the uh, Board Services Director of Indiana School Boards Corporation, and they're tasked with uh, keeping all of us school board members in the know and doing what we're supposed to. So uh, please give a round of applause for Steve, and thank you very much for coming to The Strand. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here tonight. And it is uh, indeed a pleasure to be able to spend a little bit of my time with all of you. Uh, I feel honored to be here uh, on behalf of the Indiana School Boards Association and school boards and school corporations across the state of Indiana. So on the subject of the Indiana School Boards Association, just a little bit about that group. Um, if you don't know, we are a nonprofit association and we are one of many just about every state has an association like ours in fact I came to Indiana from uh, work that I did in Ohio with the Ohio School Boards Association and our whole purpose is supporting public schools supporting the uh, leadership of those schools and uh, we do that by working directly with boards of education that's my realm uh, advocacy legal services uh, and, and uh, communication services as well. So there are a variety of things that we do to support uh, the work of our school corporations across the state. We also work in conjunction with our sister associations. IAPSS is the Superintendents Association, and uh, IASBO is the uh, Association of School Business Officials. They work with uh, all of the financial people around the corporations, and so between the three of us, uh, we, we cover a lot of ground uh, with, with our school leaders. So with that said, I'm excited tonight to be able to talk to you a little bit more about uh, a subject that's not often well understood among communities, and that is what are school boards and what are school boards supposed to do? Uh, and how are they supposed to operate? So that's what tonight's talk is, is all about. I'll share with you a little bit about me and how I ended up here on this stage. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about it. I don't know about any of you, but have you ever had that path through life and then you look back and you wonder how in the world did I end up here? 
because uh, I can assure you as an undergraduate student, when I was studying music, uh, specifically vocal music and performance, I was not ever envisioning that I would be in Shelbyville, Indiana, talking to some people about uh, school board governance. But, but um, that's where I am. And my, actually, my route here uh, was not totally unpredictable. Uh, my father was an educator. And he spent his life, 60 years in public education altogether. 22 of those were serving as a superintendent. So when I grew up, I always had the honor of being in school and being the son of the superintendent. I was well known as among the teachers especially uh, that my dad was the boss. But uh, one of the things my dad did in his 22 years, and I also uh, say that my mother was a teacher for over 30 years. So. Uh, between the two of them, there was quite a tenure there in, in public education. But one of the things my dad did, uh, either intentionally or otherwise, was he always included me in his work. I was always acutely aware of the work that he did and his work with school boards. And, and so uh, when I came out of college, I started my career as a teacher, uh, moved on to other areas, but always somewhere in education. In fact, when I ended up at the Ohio School Boards Association, uh, a little over eight years ago, well, almost nine years ago now, uh, I actually was working for a high-end audio manufacturer in northern Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati, and we lived in the Cincinnati area in Ohio. And in that work, I got to travel to about 30 different countries, but I also found out that I, I really loved working with adults in the area of education. So I traveled all over the world, literally, uh, teaching people who install high-end audio and home control and commercial control systems, and that was my work. And I loved doing that work, but also had found myself back in the community, as life would have it, where my father was superintendent, the same community where I graduated from high school. And so I kind of went back to that community, a uh, relatively well-known commodity, and so it was not far removed think that somebody would come to me and say, hey, have you thought about running for the school board? And in fact, I had thought about that. In fact, in the back of my mind, I thought at some point I probably was going to run for the school board and serve in that capacity. And so um, I did. I made that decision that, you know what, I, that is something that I want to do at the encouragement of some people. And uh, <laughs> to the point where I remember a friend of ours, uh, another educator, had taken my father aside one day when we were all together, and he asked him, when he found out that I was uh, on the ballot for the school board, when I had lost my mind. And in fact, I can guarantee you that there's not a school board member out there that has served for any period of time that has not asked themselves, did I lose my mind? What did I sign up for, and why am I doing this? But the other side of that is, as I found out, and so many others have, is that school board service is this really oddly uh, rewarding job. It is something that you do sometimes when you wish you were doing something else, but most of the time it is just a rewarding position that you have that you get to do in your community, for your community. Um, I heard David mention earlier talking about it as, as community service, and it really is. It's community service of kind of the highest level if you think about it. Um, I don't know of any board members who actually go into the work for the money, because uh, there's really not a lot of it there. But uh, on the other hand, what you get back uh, is, is incredibly enriching. So that is what ultimately led me to an opportunity when that company that I was working for uh, was suddenly bought out by a multi-billion dollar mega national or mega corporation uh, from France. And I did that for a year working for them and I decided this is not what I want to do anymore. In fact, in that period of time I had been elected to my school board, I had realized that my life was focused on being a member of my school board and being in that realm and my regular job was kind of taking a back seat. And so at that point when I hit a crossroads uh, in career, when it suddenly occurred to me, you got to do something and you don't want to do this anymore, what are you going to do? I went back and I dusted off the old resume and literally the day that I decided I was going to get that out there and look for something else, 
I opened up my school board member inbox, in my email, and right there was an announcement from the Ohio School Boards Association that they were looking for somebody, somebody to serve on their executive staff. And when I read the description, I thought, wait a minute, working in the realm of, of, of helping board members, okay, I, I understand that. Education, I definitely understand that. Working with adults and in an educational setting, I definitely understand and enjoy that. And there wasn't anything in that job description that I didn't identify with. So I threw my hat in a ring. And now at this point, when I'm standing here talking to you, I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. So that was my little twist and turn to end up here. But what I'm looking forward to sharing with you tonight is a little bit more insight into what it means to be a school board member and what school board governance <coughs> means overall. Um, so one of the things I like to ask board members when I meet with them is, what prompted you to run for your board or how did you end up in this seat? Um, and, and there are some very common answers that often come up. Um, so, you know, why do people seek a seat? Well, most of them will tell me the same thing that I experienced. Somebody influential or people in the community came to them and said, I wish you would run for the school board or you ought to consider running for the school board or you know what, you would be a really good school board member. Um, and it usually leads to that person then saying, you know what, I would like to do that. And usually there are people who are very involved in the community, very involved in the schools, and have identified with those schools. So that's one reason. Another reason is, well, maybe you're looking at things in the schools and you think, I would like to be part of a solution because I'm not necessarily happy with what's happening, or I have questions about the way things are being done, and I want to be on the, on the other end on the solution side. Um, not an unusual reason for running. There is, oftentimes I'll hear this too, well generations have served on the school board. Um, one gentleman that I talked to told me that he was actually a fourth generation school board member in that community and that that had spanned over 60 years of service altogether. I was like, wow. So I asked him, I said, do you have a son or daughter who are following you? And he said, I don't know, we'll see. Um, but, but that's not an unusual scenario, is for that role to kind of be passed down through the generations. And then there are an awful lot of people who have been involved in education, teachers, oftentimes current teachers, former teachers, aides, bus drivers, administrators, who decide that they want to be involved on the governance side. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a little bit. What does that mean, governance versus administration? Um, and those are oftentimes people that say, you know what, I really wanna be involved and I want to work in this school corporation at a different level or in a different capacity. And then you just, you're one of those people who you want to be influential in your community. I remember not long after I started working with the Ohio School Boards Association and meeting with a school board there, in, this was in the Cincinnati area at the time, and one of those members, when I asked the question about how did you end up on this board, he said, well, when he had moved to that community, he knew he wanted to be on the town council. And so he ran for that seat, and he served on the town council for some time. But as he was serving, he was looking at what was happening, considering the work that he was doing, and he said it became very apparent to him that if he really wanted to have influence and be a positive influence in his community, that he needed to be on the school board. So he resigned his seat on council and then ran for school board, and has been serving there ever since. It is one of the most influential positions in any community, especially a tight-knit, smaller community where that school corporation really is at the heart of the community. I always tell board members, and I believe this 100%, that the community and the schools are absolutely connected. Some people may not want it that way, but you know what, they are. There is no way you can extract one from the other. I always kind of smile when I drive into a town and it says home of the Panthers or, or you know, home of, of the Lions or whatever that school mascot is. It's that, it's that identification that 
community has with the schools and the school has as part of that community. Um, so the school board member and that school board governance is an extremely important position. Um, and, and I always tell candidates who are thinking about running for the school board, this is not something to be jumped into or taken lightly because this is a serious commitment. Um, so let's get into that a little bit. Oop, there we go. One of the things that people don't necessarily know when they're running for a school board is how complex the work actually is. And you don't know until you're actually sworn in and now you're in that seat as a board member. Um, and then whole worlds of complexity will open up to you. Um, I like to share the story about you know, my own personal experience. I joke with people that, well, I thought I knew it all when I was elected as a board member, but that's not far from the truth. I mean, I was raised with a superintendent of schools. Uh, I knew board members all my life. In fact, at one point, I remember asking my dad when we were going to the Dairy Whip in our local community, we're getting ice cream, and up walks one of the board members, and of course, you know, hey, Dean, how are you? Oh, I'm good, how are you? And next thing I know, they're having a 45-minute discussion on a, a picnic table. And I'm, oh gosh, when's dad gonna be done? And finally dad comes over and I says, hey, you know, I asked him this when he got in the car. I said, you know, aren't you the superintendent? He said, yes, I am. Aren't you the boss? He said, well, yeah, yeah, they, everybody reports to me. Well, then why do you work for a school board? And his answer to me is always stuck in my head. He said, well, that school board is very important. Those are people from the community, and they help me understand what the community needs, what's important in the community. They help me know if the decisions I'm making in my job are the right decisions to make. I can't do my job without the school board, and I never forgot him saying that to me. Um, so that relationship, superintendent to school board, is incredibly important uh, for the, the function of the school corporation. But there are other things when you get into that seat. Somebody, a teacher asked me uh, not long after I was elected, we were at a school event, and she said, so what surprised you about being a school board member? I wasn't expecting that question, and I stopped, and I thought about it, and I said, what surprised me? I hadn't been at it that long yet, but you know, I, my answer to her was, I didn't realize how much reading I was gonna be doing. I didn't realize how much time I was going to be looking at stuff and data and going back to the people in the schools. What does this mean and what is this telling us and what, what are we supposed to know about this data? Those are, I had so many questions um, and, and found myself diving into things and, and you know what it's like to read things online, right? And you get to a line where there's a link and oh, I wanna learn more about that and I would click on that link and I would dive into another realm and I would go deeper and I would go deeper and I found I was spending a lot of my time reading, learning, attempting to understand because in the end there's a lot to understand. So there, there's all of that, but there's something else about the complexity of serving on a school board that's really important to understand, hopefully, before you actually become a member of the school board. Because afterwards, you spend a lot of time working with school board members on this, on this very subject. And that is this equation. <laughs> this, was, uh, this was an equation that was shared with me by one of my colleagues when I first started working in the Ohio School Boards Association. Um, she, she showed me a, a version of this, and I went, oh, yeah, yeah, that covers it. If you think about it, yeah, there, there is always something happening politically, and, and yes, schools are right in the middle of that oftentimes. Um, you are elected to your position. You're not appointed, you're elected. Um, there's legislation, moving target. When I was in Ohio, in four years, graduating seniors had five different sets of standards for graduation. And our argument was, how are you supposed to know what the expectations are if you have no idea what the expectations are? So yeah, there is that moving target that's always happening. Um, and then you take board members who have been elected, who may or may not know each other, but oftentimes they don't, and then you put them all at the same table and you say, okay, do your work. And oftentimes that's the introduction 
to school board work. My orientation was when I got sworn in and I sat down in my seat at the table, there was my name plate, well that's kind of cool, there's a four or five books. Here, we wanted you to have these for your library. Well, okay, I'll dive into those because that was the, the education program prior to getting into it. So, so then when you look at all that and think about all that, how does that not equal chaos? Well, but usually not. It works, and there's a reason why it works. I'm going to dive into that. First of all, come on, change. Oh, there we go. How does that scenario work? That's a good question. Um, come on. Bill, can you advance that? Thank you. There are some rules. Now here's one of the things that's true, and this is one of those many things that's consistent from state to state to state. Legislatures don't lay out a whole lot of prescriptive rules for board member service. Um, there's not a whole lot of do's and don'ts, and, and a lot is left to local decision making and a local control, um, which is important, but it's also important to know that coming into as a board member. So what are some of those rules? Well, yeah, you adopt policies and you approve those policies. The, the school board is the policy making body, although I would submit to you, and anybody who served on a board knows this, that there are those policies that are under the board's jurisdiction. You're responsible for having this policy in place, um, and, and you create that policy. But you know, most of them are coming to you via the State Department of Education and the legislature. Legislature takes an action. The State Department of Education then informs the school corporations, you need to have this policy in place. Now you can change that some in language, but the intent of that policy is there, and you have to do that. But that's, there is not a policy in the corporation that's not adopted without school board approval. So that's an important part of it. Um, you do employ and evaluate. Uh, I spent a lot of time working with school board members about the evaluation part. That's kind of a hard thing to do when you're five people and you're off in your professional lives, but you have to evaluate, and that evaluation part's important. Employing the superintendent is what we always tell board members is your most important decision, period. But you are the only ones who can actually hire a superintendent. There is, come on, there we go. Um, there is meetings in public, which I know that all of you know about, and there is that agenda with recommendations. A lot of those recommendations, again, are handed down from state and even federal level but the board has to consider those. They have to adopt recommendations. Um, you have to approve the annual budget. And I always tell board members, you may or may not be a financial person. I am not a financial person. But understanding that budget, what's coming into the budget, how is it being used, what kind of shape are we in financially is pretty darn important because it's really easy from, from your uh, administration to get a budget and say, hey, everything's looking good. We're in good shape. Great. Yep, let's adopt it. But you need to understand what's in there. That's important. Um, then there is, come on, there we go. Um, you have to act as the liaison for that community. This is an important role. It's also kind of a tricky role because there are those people you know and who you work with, you communicate with, you live with, um, and you know where they're coming from and, and you hear from them, but there's also the whole rest of that larger community that we always tell board members, remember, once you're elected, you represent everybody in your community. You need to be listening to everybody in your community, and that's a lot of people, and that's a lot of opinions and a lot of ideas, um, but it's so important for board members to be tuned into that. Um, so that is a important role. Then there is this one. And this is where it really kind of gets complicated in a lot of situations um, in terms of serving on a board and being part of that board governance. One thing that is very clear in Indiana statute, and again, this is another thing that's consistent state to state to state, you are the governing body. And I always highlight that word body. That is such an important word when it comes to school board service. The work that the school board does is corporate. It requires being able to listen well, 
to communicate well, to seek to understand. You know, all those things are, are incredibly important for board members. And there is no individual decision making. Now, I had a new board member approach me once when I made that comment. And she asked, so you mean to tell me I don't have any authority? And I said, no, you, you actually have a lot of authority. And you have great influence. But that authority is when you are with your fellow board members, when you're in public session, and you're voting as a board. That's where that authority rests. And so in statute, they're very clear about that. Um, and that's why when I hear uh, board members say things like, I will, I bristle a little bit. I'm like, mm, no, you don't have the ability to say that. But you as a board are going to make important decisions for your school corporation. But hopefully, you're going to make those decisions in concert with your superintendent and his or her administration and your community and their wishes and desires. Um, and you're going to be weighing a lot of things together before you move forward and you make those big decisions. Um, I, uh, I learned something uh, as a new board member when we were making a pretty big decision about a school that yes, that is a very emotional thing in a community. And we said, well, we've been talking about this for a long time. And yet when we actually came down to making the decision and actually voting, we had to hold the board meeting in the high school gymnasium to be able to accommodate all the people who are now coming to meetings. And we were used to a meeting where I might have five or six community members there. And we thought, well, this isn't anything new, but we learned something really important as a board. And we even made comment about this, that maybe we didn't spend enough time really making it clear to the community what decisions we were thinking about making and, and why we were arriving at decisions that we were arriving at. Um, because there were a lot of people who didn't see it coming. So, you know, that's just one of those things that add to the complexity of serving on a school board. Um, so that's always an important one for people to remember. You don't have individual authority. You do need to work with your fellow board members. And then there's this thing. You probably have heard the phrase, stay in your lane. Well, there are lanes for the work. I always uh, have, have never really appreciated that because I feel like when somebody says, tell me to stay in my lane, they're just saying, be good. Just sit over there. Don't get in the way. But what it really means is there is a specific job for the governance side of the work and then a specific job for the administrative side of the work. One is the school board, the other is the superintendent. When it works best is when those two have a very close collegial relationship. Because yeah, like you're driving on the highway, there are times when you change lanes. There are times when that happens but you understand what lane you're supposed to be driving in is, is really an important thing. So when we talk about the governance side, what does that mean? Well, what are the things on that side? They are things like policy. We talked about that, yes. You have to adopt policy. Board members need to know what's in that policy manual and they have to be accountable to those policies ultimately as they expect the people in their school corporation who are working in that corporation to be accountable to those policies. There is maintaining vision and goals. Now, this is not something that I ever prescribe to boards that they do on their own. You know, hey, here's a mission statement. We created this. Oh, here's some goals we came up with. Here, go do these. Again, it's something that you do in collaboration with the others in your corporation. But if you want something to be successful at school board, you have to own it. You have to own what that is. Um, in a meeting with a, a district that was making some pretty bold changes in curriculum moving forward, and they were doing it system-wide, and um, one of the board members made the comment when we were meeting, I really hope this works. And my comment was, you need to know that it's going to work. This is your plan moving forward. If you don't believe in it, guess what? It's not going to work. And I said that, and the superintendent looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, Mr. Horton, could you say that again? 
<laughs> it's so true that you got to own it um, as a board as you move forward. So, so the work that goes into creating those is so important. Um, yeah, you're in charge of oversight and you're in charge of evaluating your superintendent and all of that happens through that relationship that has to happen between superintendent and the members of the school board to understand where are we being successful? Where are we struggling? What do we need to work on? You know, what are our concerns moving forward? What do we celebrate? All of those things. Proving the recommendations. Sometimes that's pretty perfunctory. A lot of times it is, but there are other times when it's a lot of work and you have to study and learn a lot of stuff. Um, you're representing the community and that's important. Um, you always have that sense that as a school board member that, uh, yeah, they're watching me. The community is watching me. I didn't know how much uh, until the second meeting we had, we had actually implemented cameras and local TV station was broadcasting our meetings and a couple of us new board members thought, this is great, I'm glad we're doing this and we had a meeting that lasted 25 minutes and I thought, wow, that was quick and then the next Sunday in church, a very prominent community member cornered me and said, hey, I watched your board meeting on, uh, that you just had. And I thought, oh, great, somebody watched it. And her comment to me was, here's what I learned. I learned that all you board members know your names and you know how to say yes. And it occurred to me, it's like, yeah, that was what somebody would get out of that meeting. But you know what else I learned? The answer that we already discussed all this stuff and we knew how we were going to vote before we went to the meeting is not really a great answer because there's a reason why school boards meet in public. So that whole public facing side of it is kind of important and the decisions you make you realize are important and it's important that your community understands the decisions that you're making. Um, and then there's advocacy. I would say, yeah, one of the things that ISBA does um, that is so important is really promote advocacy at the state level among all of our board members. And that is get involved, know who your legislators are, establish a relationship. We, we, we help them understand how to, how to testify and how to communicate with the legislators and how to really advocate for the things that you think are important. All of that's great, but I also say advocacy is also for your school corporation in your community. If you don't believe in the work your school corporation's doing, who will? So board members have to remember that. Um, and then there's, yeah, this word, consensus. What is consensus? Well, it's that, it's that time when we make a decision and I may not be really happy with it, but I can buy into it. I understand why and I can go forward and I can support it. That part can be really difficult sometimes and that's where communication um, between the whole team needs to be really strong that everybody's voices are heard. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, so on the administrative side, well, you know, board members adopt policy. The superintendent and, and superintendent's administrative team have to create administrative guidelines. How are we going to implement and enforce that policy was adopted? So they do that part. Um, they implement the strategic plan. Hopefully, the board, the administration, and more people are involved in creating what that plan's gonna look like and moving forward. But the person who has to make it happen in the schools is the superintendent. Staffing decisions, evaluations, overseeing all of that. Um, school corporations, uh, one of the important things to remember, and oftentimes this gets overlooked, the school board is the board of directors. The corporation itself is a pretty complex, multifaceted organization with a multi-million dollar budget. And I don't care what geographical area you're talking about, they're in the top five employers in that area. So it's kind of a big deal. And so all the hiring, the moves that happen with staff in the middle and all that, um, that's all under the superintendent's umbrella. Acting on the approvals. Okay, we approved this, now we gotta put it into action. That again falls under the superintendent. Developing programs, obviously the superintendent doesn't develop all the programs, but oversees what's happening in those schools. And then when it's really working well, that superintendent is constantly 
communicating back to the board, this is how we're doing. And I always tell boards, anecdotal is not okay. You can't say, yeah, we're doing a pretty good job. Teachers are pretty happy. Everything's going good. No, I want more. I want to know how do we know it's so? What's the data? What are the measures that are saying we're being successful? Those are important. And board members should be demanding that from the administrative side. And administrative side should be feeding that to the board members. So everybody's locked in and you have a good view of what's actually happening in the corporation. Then there is, come on, you can do it. There we go. This is kind of a big one. I've got this book on the shelf in my office. It's got a blue cover and it says Indiana school laws and rules. And there's this, every superintendent in the state has one of those. It's about three inches thick, weighs a whole lot. Um, I heard a superintendent say that when he goes to the legislature and he meets with, with his legislators, he likes to carry that book with them, drop it on their desk and say, you know what, we have enough laws we don't need more. It's a big book, and it's an important book, and the administrative side has to do a really good job of making sure that that school corporation is operating within those guidelines. That's not easy work. And then there's consensus. We talked to board members about the consensus process. How do you come to arriving at a decision that everybody can get behind and support? That part's important, but the superintendent needs to be a crucial part of that process as well. Helping the board understand what's important to understand and helping them understand the whys and the hows of, of what needs to happen um, is very important to that process. So when it all works well, both sides understand what side of the road they're on, but they also work very closely together. And, and it's a continual move down the road together. Um, I heard it described once as kind of a dance. If you think about it, when we're dancing, sometimes I might be leading. Other times you might be leading. But we're always moving in this dance together. Board work's kind of like that. And I thought about this, because one of the things that is going to happen if you're a school board member is conflict. If there's going to be a place where there's conflict, it's going to happen with the school board. It, it's a given if you serve for any length of time. So how do you deal with that? That's another area that, that boards have to become adept at. And one of the advantages, um, is speaking to somebody before uh, our program tonight, and we were talking about COVID and the comment about, you know, it's nice to hear some good things that come out of COVID. Well, when the great lockdown happened in the, somewhere in mid-March and I found myself working at home and I wasn't traveling out to school districts and I was finding a lot of time to get into things and read. And one of the things I encountered was an article from a woman named Leanne Davey. She's uh, a psychologist and she works specifically with corporate leadership but in this article that was titled, Conflict is a Good Thing, she talked about conflict. And in fact, that whole concept was not new to me. Conflict can be a good thing. Conflict is where you grow. Conflict is where you find innovation and improve. Um, and in absence of conflict, you typically don't go anywhere. You don't grow. And so, yeah, it is a good thing, but how do you work with it? And I thought her words um, were, were a good reminder um, for people like me and oftentimes board members who don't want to go to conflict, they don't want to be in that arena, um, it's not a comfortable place, but it also is that place where you do learn and grow if you realize that it's important to the work that you do. And she refers to it as, as a debt. If you avoid it, you build up a debt, and it just keeps building until now you can't deal with it anymore. So here's something that she shared, and I thought I'm going to share this with you too because it might help you understand um, just as it does board members when I talk to them about this. And that is she has an analogy that she uses in her work that really hit home with me. And I went, ah, yeah, that describes the work um, as, it, as it really should happen. And that is, she says, here we go, you're not rowing a boat, 
In fact, one of the things she talks about in, in her publications and the work that she does is you can take those motivational posters with the guys in a rowing skull and they're all working together and they're rowing uh, down the water, that throw those in the trash. You don't go anywhere with that. That's not how you grow and how you get better. How you really do it is consider spreading a tarp. And I read that and I went, yeah, that's what it is. Think about that for a minute. What does it take to spread a tarp? Why do you have a tarp? Why when it starts to rain in a ball game does the, the, the ground crew run out and immediately spread a big tarp over the field? I've got a tarp over my grill on the deck because I paid a lot of money for it and I want to keep it a little while. Tarps protect things, but you have to spread that tarp. And you don't do it by rowing in the same direction. You do it by applying opposite tension. And if you think about it, if, if you are indeed, like every board across the state, you have tension already built in. Diverse people, diverse ideas, ideologies, coming from different places, different areas of expertise, but they're all together at the table. If you learn how to embrace that, you can do great things together. Um, and so I like to think about that tarp analogy and the fact that all of us have to take hold of that tarp and we're going to walk in our direction opposite of the other people and apply tension for that tarp to be fully extended. And I always tell board members when I talk about this, what does that represent? Well, you got the kids in your school. They're kind of important, right? I always also tell board members, if you're not here for the kids, there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out because that's the only reason to be a board member. That's my stump speech. Um, what's the second thing? Well, you've got parents, grandparents, other siblings, aunts, uncles, community members at large, community leaders, um, all of this big mix. And then you've got all the people working in your school corporation. That tarp has to cover all of that. The bottom line is, it's a really big tarp and it's a really important tarp. So extending it and doing that well is really important. You don't want to be what I heard uh, uh, Jim Mahoney, former executive director of a large education research group called Battelle for Kids. He was talking to a room full of board members. And I heard him ask a question. He said, what do you call a group of people who all think the same way, agree with each other, and always get along. Worthless. He said, if that's your board, you're worthless. You gotta have that tension. So one of the important things uh, about being a board member is understanding what's, what's my tension? What do I bring to the table? Where's my expertise? Who are the people that I identify with most closely? Those are all important things to kind of understand. So that TARP thing has everything to do with how board governance works and, and how you lead your corporation. And then there's this. David Ortiz was called out on a third strike and he didn't care for it much. That was his reaction. And I always say, you know what? <laughs> Once it's out there, you can't put it back. Part of being a board member is that public part of it, right? You have to meet in public. You're going to be faced with things where you have to be able to handle yourself and react in a positive way. Um, I got a feeling Mr. Ortiz was not real happy with his reaction after the fact. So it's kind of like, oh, well. So, But that whole public-facing part of it is part of what makes board work pretty complicated and pretty difficult at times. Um, and that's always such an important thing for board members to remember that, um, you know, while it's fun to watch him beat up a telephone with a baseball bat, that's not really the way you want to present yourself uh, in public to your community as you're doing this work. So, um, so that's another part that board members have to remember. And the part about governance that is so important is that we are able to do our work. We're able to disagree in public. We're able to wrestle with tough things, important decisions, but in the end of it, come out whole. 
One of the video clips I like to show uh, board members is when a superintendent loses his mind on a local community member who decides he's going to come up to the mic and, and share his thoughts about finances. It doesn't end well. Um, and it's one of those things where, geez, I wish that wasn't out there. So, so board members have to face that public side of it uh, in a very real way, oftentimes. And I was going to share this about school boards because I think this is an important statement um, about the work and the importance of school boards. And that is, um, back in 2008, Miami-Dade uh, Public Schools hired a man named Alberto Cavallo to be the superintendent. And you have to keep in mind, at that time, the Miami Public Dade Schools, fourth largest school district in the country, was in really bad shape. Um, they, uh, they were pretty much bankrupt. The state was going to come in and close several failing schools. The board and the superintendent were at each other's throats constantly. Board members were at each other's throats constantly. In fact, one of the statements in the story about uh, Carvalho coming into the, the Miami public schools was that people tuned into the board meetings for reality TV because they just knew there was going to be some kind of exciting fight, fist fight, something was going to happen. And so this was going on. And uh, I had a chance to meet Carvalho in 2019. Um, extremely charismatic, magnetic kind of personality. But it turns out the guy's a pretty darn capable leader, too. Um, he was the uh, National Superintendents Association's Superintendent of the Year, National Superintendent of the Year. Um, I think it was in 2013 that he got that. But he came into the district, and he realized that if he was going to have any effect on that district and that community, he needed to start with the school board. He somehow had to work to bring them together to get them in the same room and working together and working with him, which he did beautifully and indeed changed a lot in that district. But he will tell you, as well as board members who served with him, that was where it started, was that all-important relationship. Governance and administration joined working together in that important uh, kind of dance that you do together to, to bring the schools to what they should be. And I, I think it's an important thing to remember because, you know, what's the importance of school boards? Well, you've probably heard the saying, perception is reality. When it comes to school board work and how the school board functions, perception is reality. There's no more true statement. Um, and so people looked at the Miami-Dade schools as being dysfunctional inept, um, just an absolute mess. But what they were watching was the zoo that were the board meetings and that board relationship. And that was the impression they had of what was happening in schools. Reality is among the 54,000 people they had working in those schools, they had a whole lot of incredibly talented, incredibly successful people who were doing their work. But people on the outside looking at were going to see that. They were going to see the behavior of the board and, and everything that was happening on that public side of it. And that had a lot to do with bringing that um, board or that whole uh, corporation down. And so there is such an important relationship there, again, between how we work together, how we govern, and how people view our community and how they view our schools. Um, you know, that part of it is so crucial. And so I always hope, as I'm talking to people, whether board members or not, that that part is always in mind, that that perception is reality part. Um, so there it is, uh, a little bit of information about school board governance and the work that school boards do um, and the expectations among school boards and school board members. Um, so with that, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Okay. Just one, two. Okay, good. Okay. That's working. Yeah. Okay. Who's asking the question? Right here. The uh, school board association that you're a part of, mm -hmm. 
um, how many people are involved in that? We have eight staff members in the office, and then we have a 16-member board of directors that uh, works with us, and board members in those 10 regions across the state, so it's divided up, and there are uh, 10 board members who are elected uh, region directors, and, and they work directly with us and then within the regions of the district as well. So you guys serve as just the state of Indiana and the school boards? Yes, just the state of Indiana. Do you kind of act like a call a friend thing? If a school board has questions, they can contact your association? Absolutely, yeah. That's, the telephone is a major tool uh, in the work that we do uh, okay. for board members, both for me and and the attorneys that work in our office as well to help them with legal questions. Uh, one other question I have for you, and you probably know, with the uh, school corporations, who creates the school budgets? The school budgets themselves are created by the superintendent and the superintendent's financial person, whether it's the business uh, director or treasurer, whatever that title is, but the school corporations have a person that oversees the finances and works directly with the superintendent to develop that. So if there's any questions on it, the school board can question the structure of the school budget then? Yes. At a joint meeting? Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and like I said one of the things that I always think is important about being a board member is understanding that budget because it's one of the more complex things that happens in a school corporation as far as developing that and knowing how funds are being used and where funds are coming from, all of that. Okay. All righty, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Steve, if you don't mind, I'll add one thing. The budget that is advertised is different than the budget that we have in when it was uh, involving a tax rate because the Department of Local Government Finance then takes what budget you have and what you think you're going to do, and then they'll give you what your tax rate will be. And so it's a very uh, delicate thing, and uh, our business manager and I have a friendly little competition every year to see who gets closest to who gets the tax rate and <laughs> this year we were about two thousandths apart uh, with our guesses so uh, but that's how it is and, and budgets are very important yeah. that's pretty darn good um, yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> the um, well, first of all, I get on an, another note in being with school boards. Is there a tendency that school boards overreact to a small group that comes in and complains about items? Because um, I've seen that in other areas that we've been at, that you get a few that will come in and they will voice opinions. And it seems the school boards react <coughs> towards that because they don't want a negative thing to happen in the public view of that. Um, I'm not going to say that doesn't happen. Um, it may happen more so in some areas than, than others. Um, you know, one of the things that I regularly counsel board members on is just the idea that when people come into your meeting or when people are talking to you, um, they're not necessarily going to say things that you want to hear, and that's okay. That's their right to share those things with you. And as a board member, it's incumbent on you to listen to actually listen. And the other part I throw in there, if you actively listen um, without the reaction, um, you might learn something. And so uh, I think that part's important, but to, to directly answer your question, that can happen. It, it certainly can. Uh, other thing I was remembering, the state provides a, what you would call it, the minimum standards of what they want to have with school boards then are school boards allowed to go over and above the minimums that the state requires? Is that where you have yeah. individual school boards that come up with their new policies and stuff? Yeah, there, you do have the ability to adopt policy language that you feel is important for your local corporation. Um, but yeah, you're correct. What, what is handed down are minimums. You have to have at least this. A quick question I'd had was in reference to showing a consensus. You want to be able to show that consensus and not show uh, a big division among mm -hmm. the school board members. Mm -hmm. But how do you balance the showing why a board made a decision without saying individual board members felt certain ways and showing that conflict? I know that's kind of a fine line. 
yeah. kind of talked about both. Um, I'm sure that the school board you were in reference to that was in turmoil, obviously that was a very negative thing for right. the public, but there's also the other side if it seems like it's just already predetermined in a public eye, they don't get to see that division behind the scenes. How do you, how do you navigate that? Um, sometimes not easily. Um, that, that can be a challenge, absolutely. Um, you know, the best thing that I would say is uh, for, for the work to function at its very best, everybody in that table, at that board, needs to have a voice. Um, most often when divisions become very public and, and become, the work becomes divisive, is if board members feel strongly about something but don't feel like they're being heard. They feel like, well, this decision's being made in spite of, of what I feel or what I think. And so there is that important part of it that uh, as you function, you need to make sure that you're listening to everybody. And I said, especially if that other person doesn't agree with you or has a different idea, listen to them. Um, and, and what I always suggest in terms of, of the consensus there is a way to go about it that can be very, very successful, and that is before you even get to a solution phase on something, and I'm talking about the big decisions that you really have to wrangle with, um, it's important to, first of all, state what that need is, and then allow each board member to provide input, because where it's really difficult personally to function is knowing that I have those things, those values that are intrinsic to me, um, I certainly had them as a board member, um, especially where it related to cuts that we were going to make in athletics and music because I had children involved in this stuff and they had friends involved in this stuff. And for me, you know, it's where I came from. And it was, so that was, that was an important one for me. But the most important thing was, yes, I have those values that I can't remove myself from. But if I know that Others are listening to that and, and putting those onto the table, those needs on the table, and using them as criteria for a solution. Then I can be a part of that solution, and I can walk away saying, again, the consensus is not, yeah, this is great, this is our decision. Consensus is about, okay, I'm, I'm good, I'm whole, I can, I can support this, let's move forward and make this successful. Does that make sense? And so um, it, it really has to do with how the board communicates with each other and how they communicate with their superintendent. Do you agree with that, Mr. Finkel? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Here you go, Blake. All right, I'm gonna follow up to his question. Okay. So, when it comes to discussions regarding issues within the school corporation, mm -hmm. um, there, there's public access law that requires certain things only be discussed during executive session. Mm -hmm. So these conversations about issues that are not legally allowed in executive session, should they be taking place in public meetings? By open door law, yes, those are to take place in, in public meetings. Um, and the other comment I would make to that is when you're talking about something, whether you disagree or not, uh, you know, as a, as a board member, there really isn't anything that you shouldn't be able to share in public discussion other than those things that are really protected by law and are supposed to be an executive session. The rest of it you should be able to share in public. Where that becomes an issue is when it becomes personal. And then it becomes an issue. So it's not intended to be personal, but it is intended sometimes to be intense discussion um, and at times disagreement. So is there anything statewide that you guys are trying to encourage um, just like the session tonight is being live streamed and being recorded. Mm -hmm. There are so many family members that don't have the ability to come to board meetings. Um, the space is usually small, probably there can be like about 20 people in the room in participation. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a way that you as a kind of a statewide governing board could help with encouraging that? Because I see that even in our own community here, the city does a great job with that. Our county does not. And so being able to encourage each one of the different school districts to live stream it, record it, have it out there for the public, mm -hmm. is there some kind of initiative around that? Um, 
No, I don't think we have an initiative around that other than, than I have always been an advocate for that. Um, I think it's important for the public to see what the board and city councils and other uh, governance uh, groups are doing and, and to understand what they're doing. And so, yeah, I mentioned when, when I started as a new board member, the board meetings were never, never streamed. And uh, one of my personal things that I thought was important was that we start opening this up. We had local access station that said, we'll come in, we'll put in the cameras and we'll broadcast it for you free. And I thought, why wouldn't we do that? Um, I, I do think that's important. No, you know, one of the things that we have done as an association, and we're really talking about it now, is because there's been a lot of focus on public participation at board meetings recently, over the last year, really, um, one of the things that we're doing is talking to boards and board members about that whole public participation process, about being open to the public, listening to the public, understanding that Sometimes you gotta have a pretty thick skin, but you have to listen to your public and be open to what they're sharing with you. Um, and I, do, I keep going back to my bottom line, you might learn something. So. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for coming today. Anyone online have any questions? Doesn't appear to be. Uh, this is a great topic. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Uh, the Indiana School Boards Association has been a great help to people like me. I think I've taken about all the training that they offer. They do a little point system, and I was, uh, uh, I kind of floated pretty high up in those points because I was just eager to learn. So school board members across the state, absolutely, we have an outstanding resource in ISBA, and when we get frustrated about something, we call Steve or, or Lisa or Julie in the staff and say, hey, how do we handle this? So they're great sounding boards. Our next lecture will be the Public Access Counselor in May. That's the first Thursday in May. And uh, he's the one who kind of decides uh, whether open door laws are followed or not. I've followed open door for 31 years in government, and I don't find it any big problem. It's very easy to work in public. Uh, so, uh, but you'll hear all the ins and outs of that. It'll be an excellent lecture. That one will also be live streamed. Thank, thank you, everybody who uh, watched us online. And uh, we hope to see you at an event soon, uh, and especially at our concert at the end of the month. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it.